What is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at. You made it. You made it. At least most of you did. We had a traffic jam in the parking lot tonight, which, you know, those are always good problems. But, uh, you know, I apologize if it took you a while to get into the services today. Man, it's good to see you guys. If we haven't met yet, I'm Pastor Peter, but I feel like I've been gone. I, I feel like I've been gone a lot, you know? Actually, well, I, I kind of have, actually. Uh, you know, the, as many of you guys know, uh, Pastors uh, Nate, Carolyn, and I have been really traveling the world. I mean, honestly, all across South Africa, England, Germany, uh, this last week, um, Houston, Florida, in the, just domestically, Ohio, just all in the last, I just described the last uh, nine weeks. And so I, uh, between the three of us, we actually even added it up. We realized that we had done, uh, we had preached 53 times in the last nine weeks. And uh, I, uh, I, don't, I don't recommend that. I don't think, you know, <laughs> that's sustainable. But I just, you know, I, I, we, we've probably been able to speak to over 3,000 pastors. In Germany, it was 1,700. And then we spoke to a bunch of pastors in in Liverpool, and, and I'm gonna be showing some fun update videos. I, was, I, was, I had that camera rolling. I've got a lot of outtakes of Pastor Nate everywhere, but I, I just, <laughs> which are, are worth it all by itself. But I, I, honestly, I want you guys just to know that, that God is doing great things all around the world, and uh, thank you all for praying. As much as I, people, people think that I actually love travel, I actually, I'm a homebody, I would rather just be at home with a book. You know what I'm saying? So I I do it as an act of sacrifice for the Lord because I I just know that my life is not my own and my joy is found in fulfilling that mission even if that mission requires death. That's kind of the irony of the gospel is that there is no joy outside of death. And uh, I, I just... You know, I, I, I think about that a lot, and uh, I, especially tonight, I think, it's, uh, I think it was great that we sang that, that song about joy on the night when we're talking about demonology. I know that to some people, <laughs> that feels like a paradox, but it's actually not a paradox. It's actually the gospel, okay? Because the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy, and if you think about it, you know, where the Spirit is, there's freedom. So that means Deliverance really does come from a true atmosphere of joy. Not fake joy, not, not like alcohol-induced joy, not you know the other forms of joy that people could, could uh, pursue. I, I'm just saying God's joy, and of course, uh, if, if you missed this last first Wednesday, we, we're actually in part two in this series on demonology, and I, I think it's just in time because guess what? The new Exorcist movie is releasing this weekend! <laughs> And I hope none of you see it. <laughs> because I guarantee you it's not going to put godly thoughts into your head. You know, it'll, like, you know, it's like all those movies. They kind of glorify and amplify the power of the devil. And yet, uh, the one good thing about a lot of these movies, and it just feels like they just keep coming. They don't stop. The good thing about these movies is they're a constant reminder. The one thing that is really nice about them is that they remind people the devil is real. He's not a nice person. You should learn to avoid him. You know what I'm saying? At the very least. Now, maybe, maybe the whole rest of it isn't biblical, but I'm just saying, you know, there's fundamentals in there that I think are valuable. I, I just, you know, and, and uh, you know, the bad news about these movies is that it fills a lot of people with non-biblical views of demons. And, and of course, you know, the saddest part is that most Christians don't even know what the Bible teaches about it. And, and so, you know, at our, at our first Wednesday in September, um, at our first Wednesday service, I started part one, and we asked all these different questions. I tried giving you a little bit more background, a systematic theology of who really is the serpent, the devil, Satan, you know, the accuser of the brethren. We talked about just different questions like when did Satan actually fall? Where did Satan get all of his minions? Are all of his minions fallen angels or are they other things? Are there, are there multiple creatures that belong to this kingdom? And so obviously we had to dive a little bit into what we call angelology and it's the study of heavenly beings in the Bible. We talked about cherubim, seraphim, Beni Elohim, how they function. And, and I, honestly, you guys, it goes 10 times deeper than this. If I, if I went into like gibberim, ophanim, all these other cool things that God has created. I mean, think about it, God is creative. He, he, he didn't stop at 19,000 ferns. He needed 20,000 ferns, okay? That just, what does that say about our God? He just, oh, I got another idea. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
we're gonna get to heaven and realize probably everything is way more complex than even the categories that I'm even talking about. And we're gonna get to heaven and be like, oh yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll probably have to apologize for a few things I've preached over the years. But I, I just, that's why, I, but I, I, I'm trying to present it to you actually with humility so that you guys just get a little more hungry uh, to dive into your Bibles. And so, um, but the reason why we talked about angelology is because you know, if we really want to understand what demons are, then we first need to study, you know, what was the original order of heavenly beings that God outlined in the Old Testament. And so tonight, I am, I, by the end, I am going to get more practical. We are going to talk about what do demons do? How do they gain access to our lives? Um, can Christians get them? These types of questions that people ask me all the time. But before we do this, I just wanted to recap a few of the basics that I, I hit this last time, this last month, so that you can understand the bigger narrative of Scripture, okay? So uh, I'm going to start out by giving you a little bit of, a, a little bit of systematic theology, and then it's going to get a little more practical with each, with each minute, okay? So if I blow your mind, just, just stick with me, okay? Stay on the roller coaster ride. Don't unbuckle yourself, okay? I'm just telling you. And then you'll, we'll have some fun. Now, if I could be fully honest with you, though... As I was even prepping this series, and I, I actually started prepping this series probably about four years ago, and uh, there's some series where um, I, I let it cook a little longer, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, a, I, like, remember when we did our end time series, I was going to go right into the book of Revelation and preach straight through it, and the Lord was like, no, press pause on that, just cook a little longer and read a few more books, and it was good. I was glad I did, and so I... I I, I really was slow to preach this, and I, if I could be fully honest with you, I, I really debated whether or not I should even share what I shared this last week, because at first I thought, well, you know, do the good people of substance really need to know all of the details of, you know, the Elohim and the Nephilim and the blah, 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 and, you know, and I, I thought, why don't I just teach them how to just, you know, cast it out, you know what I'm saying, and then be done with it, do it in one week. And, uh, and then on the other hand, I thought, you know what, I really, really want you to understand the Bible on a whole deeper level. And there are so many passages that will not make sense until you understand some of these broader ideas, the worldview of the average Jew in the Old Testament. And so I, I just, it's, it's critical to understand those things first. And so, you know, again, part of me wanted just to cut to the chase and let's talk about exorcisms. Come on, it's like exciting, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like the emergency room moment, you know what I'm saying? And yet, you know what? We need to understand how did we even get into the emergency room in the first place so that a lot of you might avoid it. You know what I'm saying? And in order to do that, we gotta kinda go back and find, well, how did mankind even get into this problem in the first place? Do you know what I'm saying? And so here's a few nutshell summaries of week one. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time, and so if, if any of this is interesting to you, make sure you go back and, and watch the, the message, uh, which is also posted at my blog, peterhaas.org forward slash demonology. It has all the details, plus a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't share in either of these messages, okay? Now, I made the case, though, last time that the, the devil likely fell at the exact same time as Adam and Eve, okay? The idea that Satan fell before the creation of humans that didn't even exist historically until the 1700s. It was actually uh, Milton, if you, I was an English major, I had to read Milton's Paradise Lost. And that was one of the books that kind of started to mythologize this idea that Satan fell before uh, man was created. And actually that theology didn't even become popular until the 1800s. It got a name, it, called, it was called the Gap Theory, or if you're really nerdy, it's called the Ruin and Reconstruction Theory. Um, but out, all throughout history though, it was more commonly taught that Satan was a cherubim who was the high priest of Eden. In other words, he was doing his job in the Garden of Eden as the high priest wearing the ephod, and he was supposed to actually be coaching Adam and Eve on things, giving them insights. And of course, he betrayed that trust, he betrayed that role, and he sinned along with Adam and Eve, which is why all three of them got spanked in Genesis 3, okay? So in case you were like, well, why would God put the devil next to Adam and Eve in the first place. You, you get the idea, okay? So, like, it, there's a lot of things that will resolve once you comprehend that. And again, you don't have to agree with me on all these types of things, because a lot of these are, are complex interpretations based on complex passages. But throughout most of history, it was taught that Satan was a cherubim and that he sinned with Adam and Eve. But what about the other principalities and powers? Where did he get his minions? Well, the Bible implies that Satan at least talked roughly about 70 Elohim from God's counsel. An Elohim was a divine being, okay, that sinned along with 
Satan, okay? The Bible teaches that the Elohim were spiritual beings who helped God govern his creation. Of course, we explored uh, some of those um, texts last week. Uh, they, the, the Elohim existed when we were created. They were actually worshiping when God created the earth, the book of Job says. And of course, they look like humans, which is why God said, let us make man in our image. He was actually referring to the Elohim who have the same image as us, who has the same image as God. Some people will say that, oh no, the God was saying that to the Trinity. Uh, the Trinity knows everything else the Trinity knows, okay? He doesn't have to say to himself. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, just, anyway. Uh, but you get the idea. He was saying it to the other Elohim, and there's a lot of passages where you see God interacting with the Elohim in this exact sort of way, okay? So they were part of his divine counsel, and uh, they existed when we were created. They look like humans, but they function differently than humans in that they have additional divine attributes. Now what? Uh, I, I, we could only guess, but um, there's a lot of different philosophies about how their bodies are exactly different. But the Bible teaches in Genesis 6 that the, the 70 Elohim took human wives and the Bible argues that it created a half-breed, a half-breed, half-human, half-Elohim race called the Nephilim, which were, you know, which actually means in Aramaic, giants. Okay, now, um, if you paid attention to what I said, okay, now, I, I went into detail as to why Satan did this, how he talked them into this, and uh, how it related to the Genesis 3 prophecy. So I'm, I'm just, this is just recapping, but if you really pay a close attention, you're like, Wait, Peter, you said 70 Elohim fell. Where did you get that number from? Now, uh, like, why, why would I say that there were 70 Elohim who fell in Genesis 6? Because it doesn't mention the number there. Well, it's actually because that number is, is actually revealed to us in both Genesis 10 and Deuteronomy 32, okay? And, and, they, and I'm gonna show this to you real quick, okay? In the context of Deuteronomy 32, again, this is after, you know, the Israelites went through the wilderness, they failed, they had, a, you know, 40 years in the wilderness, and now Deuteronomy is basically Moses giving everybody the pep talk to get into the promised land, okay? This is how we screwed up. This is how we're gonna do better this next time, okay? It was almost like the halftime show after the really miserable first half, okay? So, uh, and so this is Deuteronomy in the context of Moses is talking and he starts to refer to the Tower of Babel, okay? Now, if you forgot the story of the Tower of Babel out of Genesis 11, it's where humans did a third and final defiance of God's plan. There were, people talk about the fall of mankind in Genesis 3, but actually there were three falls, okay? Genesis 3, Genesis 6, Genesis 11, three falls, Okay, now it's important that you understand that, otherwise you're not gonna understand the, the bigger narrative that the Old Testament argues, okay? So the Tower of Babel was basically the last straw. If you actually read it very carefully, God said, okay, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. He repeated all the same things that he did way back in the Garden of Eden, but he's hoping that they're gonna get it right. And rather than scattering over the face of the earth, ultimately, earth was meant to be totally surrounded by the garden. It would be a ginormous ruling council from which God would populate the universe, and then we, he'd have all these other galaxies and planets, and then ultimately, this would be Eden. This is where it would all be ruled, and then we would you know, create more of us, be fruitful and multiply. Okay, and when people would look at us, they would see God because we look like God. Does that make sense? So it's like a flow chart. God was actually creating an army to take over the universe, okay? So, so you know, th so, so Babel happens, and of course, a lot of people remember Babel because God, you know, divided all the languages and they couldn't understand what the other people were saying, but they missed the whole point of what actually was happening at Babel. Um, so let me just quickly define it for you, okay? So Babel was the last straw. And, and, and remember, the tower was actually not just a tower. Yet why would God be so offended about a tower? Well, it's because, remember, Eden was built on a mountain, Ezekiel 28 says. And so this tower was essentially their way of saying, we want to start our own government. It was a coup d'etat. It was like, we are going to start an alternate government. We are going to create a man-made mountain to our glory. And rather than you living on the mountain, God, we are going to live on our own mountain. And we're going to do the exact opposite of what you want. Instead of scattering, we're going to create the greatest city so that none of us ever has to leave. And it was really an act of defiance, if you think about it. And so they were trying to recreate 
Eden, a man-made Eden. And of course, keep in mind, just, you know, Eden was not merely a garden, it was a ruling council. It was a capital building. So again, Babel was a rebellion government and God was, so really what, if you really wanna see what Babel was from God's perspective, it was like this. God was like, oh, so you really think you're better off without me, okay. Fine, then I'm gonna split up your languages so that you can't understand each other and then I'm gonna give you over to do what ought not be done which is a theme all throughout Romans when Paul, Paul is recapping it. I'm gonna, that's what God does when we refuse to follow his rule. He's like, okay, I'm gonna see how that goes for you. You can go without me. And so what God actually does, okay, God actually gave the people over to the false fallen Elohim that had fallen in Genesis 6, okay? So read, like if you read Genesis 10, the chapter before Babel, what's really interesting is it's one of those really boring chapters where you're like, why am I even reading this? You know, it's called the Table of Nations, and it says, you know, it has all these names, and you're just like, you, okay, I'm gonna scream and read this, okay? You know what I'm saying? Like, I know the Bible has a lot of those things in it that seem kind of confusing, but it's actually very, very profound because if you, if you look at it, what it actually shows is there's about 70 nations that God that, that were created after Noah is really the idea. And so really, the reason why that is Genesis 10 is that it is setting up Genesis 11. How did we get 70 nations and these, you know, presumably 70 different languages, okay? So how did we get this? Well, here's the 70 nations. There is one translation that has 72, okay? So um, you're gonna hear a little disparity here about 70 or 72, but I want you just to, I'm not gonna explain that right now, but I want you just to follow me here because if you really think about what, 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 what the Tower of Babel was, the Genesis lists these 72 uh, or 70 nations, and then the next chapter, how we got there at Babel. And so Moses is talking about Babel in Deuteronomy 32, 8, and check out what he says here, okay? The most, this is Moses talking about what, what God was doing at Babel. The Most High gave the nations their inheritance. What is an inheritance? It's you get what your father gives you, okay? So... He gave them their inheritance when he divided all mankind. He set up boundaries for the people, like using their languages, according to the number of the sons of God. Okay, the Hebrew word there is beni Elohim, the Elohim sons of God, beni Elohim. Now, this is, so just, you're gonna notice though that in, there's a few modern translations, like if you have an NIV, it'll say sons of Israel in there and you're like, well, why would it say that? Um, all the newest translations will say sons of God ever since actually we've discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is like the oldest version of the Old Testament that we have. And so all of the oldest, most reliable manuscripts say sons of God. Uh, it was only a few that said sons of Israel. And the reason why, uh, so somewhere in history, somewhere somebody edited that out, but then we have older manuscripts that are more reliable, okay? Now the reason why it should not say sons of Israel is because, you know, think about it. Israel didn't even exist, okay? So how could you have sons of Israel when Israel didn't even, wasn't even, you know, Jacob wasn't even born, let alone Moses and the, you know, like, so it doesn't make any sense. And, and actually, the reason why we know it is, in fact, the sons of God is because, actually, uh, Deuteronomy 419, Moses says the exact same thing, except he actually unpacks it a little bit more. Um, he was talking about these fallen Elohim in, in, from Genesis 6. And remember, one of the other alternate names of the Elohim are morning stars, okay? So you've heard that expression. It, it, some of people, will, they'll use it to refer to Christ. Other people will use it to refer to Satan. Other, but morning stars was a general name used, or holy ones, the glorious ones, as some translations would say. Are these, these are all names for this ruling council, the Elohim, okay? So morning stars, heavenly host, Remember, these are all important, okay? And so Moses says in Deuteronomy 4.19, it's like a, another version of the one that we just read, and when you look up into the sky and you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly host, okay, a reference to, and, and a lot of times they, people would say that, that the glorious ones, they looked like stars, okay, which is why another nickname was Coco Beam, um, the stars, okay? So, uh, when he says, when you look up to them and see them, do not be enticed into bowing down to them. These are people, okay? He's referring to people, not just objects in the sky. Do not bow down to them and worship things the Lord your God has apportioned 
to all the nations under heaven. In other words, it's referring to Babel, where God gave the nations over to their false gods and said, let's see how that goes for you, okay? So again, the, the Elohim were a part of the heavenly host, the Bible says, Job 38. And of course, at Babel, God was saying, if you rebels think that you're better off worshiping false gods, then let me officially give you over to them. This group, let me introduce you to Molech. This little group, let me, let me uh, introduce you to Dagon. This group, like false gods, I'm going to show you, I'm gonna give you what you really want, okay? So, so then, well, where, where did we get the idea that there were 70 that fell away from God, that, that fell away from God in Genesis 6? Well, again, Moses said the nations were created, okay, let's go back to this, according to the number of the sons of God, and presumably the fallen ones, okay? So according to the number. Now, so M Moses actually doesn't say here because he, he assumed his audience automatically knew it from the table of nation 70, okay? So according to the number of the sons of God, he assumed that this is kind of obvious, again, or maybe 72, depending on, you know, what translation you had, right? And, and this number is critical because if you think about Babel, think about it like this. God was finally saying, I'm done with all y'all. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you to your false gods and I'm gonna start a nation myself. I am gonna take a guy right out of the middle of your chaos named Abraham. I'm gonna start my own nation. I'm gonna bless him so thoroughly, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, turn him into Israel, and I am going to overtake the world and actually win the entire world back over from your 70 false gods, and I'm gonna do it in a, in a very specific way. And of course, what happens? The very next chapter after Babel, Genesis 12, he calls Abraham and he creates the nation of Israel. Is this making sense, everybody? And okay, now get this. When he forms that nation, he sends them to Egypt so that they would be fruitful and multiply. If you read the beginning of Exodus, it's like talking about how fast they grew, right, in Egypt. And then when he calls them out to Mount Sinai, guess how many elders God told Moses to appoint? 70. Why? Well, some believe it was God flexing on the Elohim, okay? It was basically, he was trash talking the 70 Elohim. He was basically saying, hey, I am gonna set up my own nation in opposition to you, and I've got your 70, and you've got your 70. Let's see how this goes. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'll, so essentially, that's kind of what was happening. Now, get this. Jesus did the same thing in the New Testament, Okay, remember this? Remember in Luke 10 when Jesus sent out the 70 or 72, if you read it, depending on your translation, okay? He sent them out to do what? To cast out demons. Interesting. This was on purpose. What was Jesus doing there? He was actually saying, let's start the war. Wouldn't this be fun if you, and then they all freak out. They're like, oh my gosh, the demons obeyed us. It was like so cool. And then he's like, just rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Just simmer down a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, Jesus knew that I still have to die for that sin in your life. Okay, so, you know, like, so you get this idea. Jesus was essentially starting that, that war. Okay, so whenever you see a number in the Bible, you, you have to follow it because there's always a more profound reason behind it. God is orchestrating something really Big. Okay, now what's fascinating is that according to Jewish tradition, based on the Old Testament, a lot of people don't realize that Satan wasn't always in charge. So what do you mean, Pastor Peter, Satan wasn't, wasn't Satan the serpent in the garden? Well, probably, we do believe that. He probably was the serpent who tempted Adam and Eve. There's, there's a couple of different theories about this, but the Bible implies that actually there were multiple civil wars in the Old Testament between the principalities and powers of evil. Okay, so for example, according to Jewish tradition, there were actually multiple lead demons. There, there was Gadarel. Some people actually thought Gadarel was the one that tempted Adam and Eve. There was another tradition. Uh, Yakon was one of the top demonic forces. Then you've heard of Azazel. You've also heard of Mastema. One tradition based on Ezekiel 31 is that there was a demonic principality by the, principality by the name of Ashur, okay, who used to be the top dog. Now, uh, the, up until the flood, okay, this is kind of an interesting thing. So Ashur was actually the god of the Assyrians. And, and so he so became synonymous with the god of the Assyrians that the Assyrians, the word Assyrian actually comes from the word Ashur, okay, from the god himself. They took on his name, 
Okay, so you remember when uh, God said, don't take the name of the Lord in vain? He was actually saying, don't call yourself a Christian and then act like, a, a, like the opposite. In other words, you become like the God you serve. And so he's saying, don't take the Lord's name in vain. He was saying, don't pretend you are a Christian or that you are a servant of Yahweh and yet you live opposite. It had nothing to do with like cussing. Um, not that that's... You know, that's not good either. But I, you know what I'm saying? Like, you get the idea that, that they took the name of Ashur, okay? So now, a, a lot of people will say that Ezekiel 31 actually teaches that Ashur was the, the, the top dog, and uh, apparently Ashur became too arrogant, too powerful, and most of the Nephilim that were created were loyal to him. And so right before the flood, according to Jewish tradition, God incited a civil war between Ashur and Satan, okay? Now, in the, in the New Testament, let me just follow me here, okay? And I, I promise the whole message won't be this deep, okay? I'm just gonna give you, I'm, I'm trying to give you these little nuggets so that you can go research. Now, in the New Testament, you'll remember that Jesus referred to Satan as the prince of this world. He actually called him the prince of this world several times, John 12, John 14, John 16. A, a lot of ancient Jews actually believe that that princeship that Satan had was actually started in the days of Noah. And where does that come from? Okay, now, I, and I'm, I'm sharing all this because the New Testament texts that I'm about to read to you are suddenly gonna make more sense if you understand this is what the average first century Jew believed, okay? So a, a lot of Jews believe that Satan was actually crowned prince of the world by Yahweh, by God, to take on this civil war. And of course, it wasn't a good thing. It was almost like, let's let you guys just kind of eat each other alive. And then when God sent the flood, this is what he did. He actually took out all the Nephilim loyal to Ashur, and as the flood water sunk into the earth, the majority of Nephilim spirits were locked into the abyss, which was a very particular section of hell in the Old Testament called Sheol, and the New Testament called Hades. Now, uh, just if you're curious about all the complicated Bible references that actually, you know, form that theology, I encourage you, I'm going to write all of this in detail with lots and lots and lots of books that you can go diving into this on my demonology page. page. Just, just go to um, peterhaas.org forward slash demonology, and it'll be super, it, we're going to have so many fun little things there for you. Uh, it's a landing page for everything in this series. I'll be adding a big blog that explains all this stuff by the weekend. But, but just stick with me here, because according to Jewish tradition, when all of this transpired at the flood, this civil war, the devil asked God, after all the Nephilim were sucked into the abyss, he asked God, could I have 10% of the Nephilim spirits to test mankind? 10 is the number of testing, and it's like tithing. You've heard of that, right? 10. Okay, so 10 is the number of testing all throughout the Old Testament. And so Satan said, can I have 10% of the Nephilim spirits to roam the earth while you, because God basically was going to lock everybody into the abyss. And so Satan asked that, and, and he said, on behalf of the sinfulness of mankind, and then God, uh, according to tradition, he actually said, do it, go ahead, but only until the appointed time. Okay, so for example, have you ever read your Bible and ever been confused about where do demons actually live? Because you have these verses that talk about them as if they live in hell, and then you have these other verses that talk about them as they're just like ranging throughout the surface of the earth. So like, which is it? Well, according to Jewish tradition, both are true. Because again, 90%, because demons are Nephilim spirits killed in the flood, 90% of them are in the abyss, and the other 10% are ranging throughout the earth uh, now, honoring the prince of this world who is Satan, okay? So that's why, the reason why I'm saying all this is because all of a sudden you're gonna, there's a whole bunch of New Testament texts that are all of a sudden gonna come alive to you if you think like this. Now let's not even debate if, if those Jewish traditions are true or not, and I'm actually gonna, on my blog, talk about which ones I think are true, but I, I just, the reason why it's important is because if you understand that audience, that the average Jew believed what I'm saying to you, in the times of Christ, then all of a sudden when Jesus is talking about this kind of stuff, it'll make sense, okay? Or, or like 2 Peter 2, 4, he writes, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, okay, the New Testament word angelos is kind of a generic, it encompasses all the spiritual names in the Old Testament, so it's kind of a generic word that, that um, is confusing, but let me just read it. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, 
okay? Hades, which is the New Testament word for Sheol, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, okay? So it actually implies that demons are locked up. So if demons are locked up, how can they be afflicting us? Do you wonder that ever? Okay, so I'm, I'm resolving some of these contradictions that maybe you've, you've sensed before or felt, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, the, whenever you see ancient world, it means pre-flood, okay, in, in like New Testament speak. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people but protected Noah, this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh today. In other words, Peter is saying, hey, don't think that it's all easy for you right now today and, and like, oh, you're living in the grace of the New Testament era and you think that you can't mess things up, okay? So Peter is kind of giving them a, a really important warning, but notice that he connects, I, I think this is interesting, the judgment of these divine beings to the flood. Now, the, the reason why that's important is, is I, and I'm not saying that Peter is endorsing all of the Old Testament or all the Jewish traditions that I just mentioned, but, you know, because the truth is we do not know for sure if demons are the spirit of departed Nephilim. We do not know for sure if Satan asks for 10%. What we do know for sure is that there are some in hell that are locked up and there are some who are not. Okay, so there's, there's elements of all of this that will, will make sense and some of it will be a little confusing. But here's where it gets really crazy, okay? So if I haven't blown your mind yet, just, just watch this, okay? Because I'm just going to... Okay, so... Okay, if you read Revelation chapter nine closely, it talks about this thing called the fifth trumpet, and God unlocks the abyss. Now, the, this was meant to cause all of the Jewish people to be like, the abyss, what happened to the abyss? <gasps> Noah, oh, this is where all the Nephilim were all sucked down into the earth, and this is where, this is where uh, Ashur was, this is the civil war that was basically killed and stopped, it's gonna all, they're, they're all locked in the abyss. Well, Revelation 9 actually says that God unlocks the abyss. Why would God do that? God, they're locked up. Why would he do that? It's because he's actually starting a civil war. He knows that it all is gonna end, right? And so, of course, a house divided against itself cannot stand, and so what God is actually doing strategically is he is restarting the civil war between Ashur. And so a lot of people, it refers to this thing called Abaddon, this spirit called Abaddon that comes out of the pit with all of his, his demons. Really what it's prophesying is that there's going to be an outpouring of the demonic that's gonna result in a civil war. And of course, it, it sounds like it's bad for you and I, but actually it's really just bad for the world and it's bad for Satan, okay? So... It's important that you understand, if you don't understand the Old Testament worldview, there's gonna be all sorts of things, even in the book of Revelation, that are not gonna make sense, okay? So a lot of people argue that Abaddon is actually a sure, and that God is gonna unlock the abyss, the other 90% of the demons are gonna come up, and God is gonna incite this civil war, except this time the civil war is gonna go, it's gonna be a sure against Satan, okay? Equally interesting, Revelation 9 says this giant unleashing of demons is going to afflict non-Christians, people that, that have received the mark, okay? So, so and it, it's going to last. Note this. Whenever you see a, a number, you always have to pay attention. For 150 days or five months of the Jewish calendar, okay? The Jewish calendar is 30 days, um, five months, 150, okay? So it's going to happen for... 150 days. Now, why is that number interesting? Well, guess what? The exact number of days that God tortured Ashur in the flood was 150 days, Genesis 8.3. Now, you suddenly, if you put it all together, th this is why Jesus said about the end of the world, okay? Just stick with me. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. What was he saying? He was saying, right before the flood, it was a giant demonic civil war, and then God shows up in power, okay? Same thing is gonna happen. There's gonna be a, there's gonna be a giant civil war. Now, though probably, for a non-Christian, there's gonna be literally 90% more demons to afflict people, okay? So this is something that Christians need. If we don't know demonology, we're not ready for the end times, 
That's all I'm saying. If we don't understand how this works, also there's gonna be a lot of these references in Revelation that aren't gonna make any sense because actually of the 404 whatever verses there are in Revelation, like 360 some of them are references to Old Testament prophets, okay? So if you don't, and they're always the hard ones of course, right? I mean, Ezekiel, who reads Ezekiel? But I, I'm just saying, we sh we, you should, you should. It's just not as easy, right, okay? I, I, I'm not saying don't read it. Actually, these are the books that I love the most. People were like, somebody asked me one time, like if you, if you literally were lost on an island and you can only have one book of the Bible. And, and I was like, revelation for sure. And they would looked at me like, are you kidding? Like, really? And I'm like, of course. You know, like, mainly because I'm, you know, I've read these other ones so many times. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's more interesting to me. And I assure you, even those harder books will get more exciting, okay? So basically, so, <laughs> I mean, just, you have to understand, the Bible is so rich, there are layers upon layers upon layers of insight. I've been memorizing my Bible for 30 years, and I'm still seeing things for the first time. I'm still like, how did I not see that? How did I? So I'm just, I'm telling you guys, keep reading. Keep studying. I can't say that I, I um, am right on more things, but I do feel like I understand more of the Bible. At least God is more real to me and it gets more fun with every year. And I, I promise you, I'm not trying to break all of your brains with this message. I know this was deep, but I, I'm trying to make you hungry. I want you to be hungry for God's word. I, I, and you don't even have to agree with all this. In fact, I, 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 I challenge you, please research this. Ask the tough questions because we do need humility when it comes to uh, a lot of the complicated texts. But here's what we know for sure about demons, okay? So if I could get simple and practical real fast, we're gonna just turn this car on a dime and I'm gonna get simple and practical. I'm gonna give you seven basic precepts that we know for sure about demons. And I, I think in, in the first one, it's gonna sound kind of obvious, but it's still worth mentioning. There are spiritual forces of evil, okay? Now, I, I like, I, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There are a lot of people who would like this to say, your struggle is against your mean boss, your coworkers, that one family member who has a lot of issues. It's the US government. It's the, you know, like, it's the Illuminati, whatever the new cabal is. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people who want you to focus on a different enemy, but we who are Christians know what the problem really is. It's principalities and powers. Every second we lose track of that is a second that we can be hijacked by a non-kingdom initiative. So if you don't know what your mission is and who the enemy is, you're already kind of dead in the water, okay? So it's really important to acknowledge what if the current problem in your life right now had nothing to do with your boss, your family member, or your, even your circumstances? What if it was entirely demonic, and what if it could be entirely resolved through prayer? I'm telling you, tonight, some of you are gonna have resolution that is gonna come entirely through prayer. Now, some of, some of the problem, it's not even the devil, it's just you, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, in this next month, okay? But we're, 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 we blame so much on the devil, and even the devil's like, bro, I did not do that. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's all you, okay? And then, you know, uh, so, but we're gonna talk about how to discern that, okay? But, so there are spiritual forces of evil, okay? Second thing we know for sure about the demonic, they have a plan for your soul. The, the, there's a war against your soul, the Bible says. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's looking to devour someone. Now, if I had to wander through a, a field in the middle of the night in Africa with a roaring lion, that would not be a good thing. I don't think I would be ready. I'd be very equipped to fight that. And I, see, listen, demons know exactly how to get you, and if they're gonna get you, and actually, you know how the devil would probably get you. Most people, if I stopped them and I said, if the devil was to truly derail your life over the next three months, how would he do it? Would it be lust? Would it be impulsive spending? Would it be alcohol? Would it be, most people know already what it would, what it would be. Now, maturity is knowing how the devil would attack you and actually dealing with it. Immaturity is knowing but saying, I'm good. I think I'll make it, okay? So just, 
I, I want you to know, like, that's actually the difference between a mature Christian and an immature Christian. It's not how much Bible knowledge you have, it's how much you are applying right now, okay? So they have a plan for your soul. The third thing we know for sure, demons wait for opportune times. How do we know this? Luke 4, 13, when the devil had finished all of this tempting of Jesus, he left Jesus until an opportune time. Think about that. He's looking for an opportune time to get Jesus. And so you have to understand, the same thing is true with you. He knows when opportune times are. Oh, when you're busy, when you're distracted, when you're in this phase of your life, like the phase of young kids. Man, that was a hectic phase, wasn't it, Carolyn? You know what I'm saying? I went nuts in that phase. That was an opportune time for the devil to get me, right? There's other opportune times when you're tired, right? We talk about hungry, angry, lonely, tired, you know, four times when you are more likely to be tempted. Uh, there's all sorts of opportune times that the devil looks for. But practically speaking, when the devil has an opportune time, what does he do? Well, the demons, the fourth thing we know about demons is they whisper lies into your ears, right? If you go right back to the original temptation in, in the Garden of Eden, did God really say, you know, are you sure God isn't holding out on you? It's, it's lies trying to tempt you to think that God actually doesn't love you, that he doesn't have good things for you. Whispers lies, okay? So in Mark 9, 22, we read about a boy who had a demon, and that demon kept telling him to jump into the water and kill yourself, jump into the fire and kill yourself. And of course, the, the disciples couldn't cast it out, and Jesus comes and zings it out and says, this kind comes out through prayer and fasting. In other words, sometimes there's a process. It's not always a moment. It's a process. But, you know, you get the idea that that, that suicide was a, a demonic thing. There are lies that all of us have, okay? And those lies come at opportune times. You just had a fight with your spouse, and then the devil whispers about your spouse, I don't think they really love you. I don't think they're attracted to you anymore. Or, or your coworkers, you know, opportune times. I don't think people really care. I don't think there's any chance for promotion here, okay? Or, or you, again, there's opportune times for lies, and, and you think about even these lies, it, they... The devil has the power to afflict your emotions, and this leads us to the next thing. They can change your emotions at strategic times. Let me just show you a passage, Matthew 8, 28. When, when he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, Jesus and the disciples, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no, no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Okay, now right here, we can learn a lot. First off, there's, there's an end coming. Demons know that there's an end coming. There is an appointed time, okay? So that element of the Jewish tradition we know for absolute certain is true. There's an appointed time. Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. Now, this is kind of an interesting little portion. Why would they do that? It is kind of weird, isn't it? Like, why are demons so obsessed with physicality? Well, if you actually, if, if it is true that demons are departed spirits of Nephilims who were half humans, it means that they had bodies at some point. So they want to be embodied, okay? Which is why they seek out bodies. Well, if they can't get into a body, it, they'll get into a pig, okay? Which also says that, Animals can have demonic afflictions too, okay? So some of you are like, my dog. Uh, I don't know, and maybe, you don't know. I don't know, your cat. Everybody's like, all cats are demonized, but I, I just, we'll let that be another debate for another time, but we'll, we'll you, you, but, but here's, here's, you know what, what's interesting about this? Oh, oh, I forgot to point out, okay? In, in Luke's version of this same story, Luke 8.31, the other version of this story, it says this, right after, right after this statement, Luke adds this additional statement, the demons begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. So if you're wondering why they want the pigs, really, it's not that they want the pigs, they just don't want the abyss. Well, what's in the abyss? Well, we talked about it. It's where the other 90% of the demons are locked up. They don't want to go and be those guys. 
We were the lucky 10%, so to speak. We get to be on the earth still causing problems, right? You see? So they, it's not that they wanted to be in the pigs. They just didn't want to be in the abyss. And so they're looking for the nearest non-human that Jesus will allow them to, you know, consider. So verse 32, Jesus said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Now, why, why would the... Demons cause the pigs to commit suicide right away. Did you ever wonder that? It's because they don't want to be in the pigs so they can get out and range throughout the earth and find another human, okay? So that's the idea here. But it, and, but it did make a statement because Jesus was in the Decapolis where the fact that they had pigs, this was, this was a non-Jewish community. And at the time, remember, Jesus hadn't died on the cross. At this moment, the, the, Jesus, his ministry was not even supposed to be for them. It was for the Jews. And so there is a certain degree of commentary where this validated that the Jews have had it right to this people, okay? But I don't wanna get lost in all that. Uh, So those tending the pigs ran off, no kidding. That would be (laughs) freaky. They went to the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town, whole town, went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Just get out of here, this is weird, okay? So realize not everybody's gonna have a delightful response to Christianity. When, when people, the first time I saw a demonic deliverance, I was almost freaked out. I didn't know if I wanted to go back to church for a while. Like, I'm just being fully honest with you as a baby Christian. I'd never seen anything like that, and, and I, I really didn't even have the theology to contextualize it, because, you know, my, I had this kind of liturgical high church Lutheranism thing going on, even, you know, so I couldn't even comprehend demonology and all this, and so I realized that there is a scary element, but I do want to point this out about the pigs, okay, so just think about these pigs. One moment, they're just chilling on the, pit, on the hill, doing what pigs do, right? Oink, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> isn't life good? Let's roll around. And then the next moment, what were they doing? Running off a cliff to drown themselves. What changed? The demons, okay? Now, I know what I'm pointing out is kind of obvious, but we need to be mindful that demons have the ability to trigger us and give us weird emotional reactions at weird times. And so the older I get, the quicker I get at trying to identify demonic emotions. You know how it's like some people are overly spooky and everything is a demon? And, like, and then there's, like, I tend to be a little bit more on the rational side. And then, the, and then, like, I have to have, like, 30 terrible things happen in a row before I'm like, maybe the devil is afflicting me. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm more on the opposite side. But I, I say this to say that the demonic, it, it, it is here to afflict you. It's here to get you to fight when you're busy. It's gonna, you're gonna have more fights with your spouse. The devil is always looking to weasel his way into your life at opportune times by triggering your emotions, getting you to react. And if you don't know how to like stop, self-evaluate, experience the presence of the Lord, figure out what's going on in your life. Okay, now you can't, you can't stop the devil from giving you an emotion, but you can learn how to take that emotion captive and identify it for what it is. Does that make sense? It's kind of like the old saying goes, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from making a nest in your hair. Okay, same thing with the demonic. You, can, you, can, you can't stop it from you know, putting a thought in your head, but you can stop it from you know, dwelling on that thought, ruminating on that thought, reacting to that thought, and so that leads us to the sixth thing. If tolerated, they can live in you with permission or passivity. Notice I said those two different words are very different, permission or passivity, okay? So, and, and as evidence of this, okay, Luke 22, it talks about Satan entered Judas. Three simple words, you know, at the Last Supper. Okay, so if you're wondering if demons can enter into people, yes, they can, okay? So some people call it demonic possession. I don't really like that word, um, but we're gonna talk about it in a little bit. But uh, if tolerated, they can live in you with permission or passivity. And the seventh thing we know for sure is God wants to protect us more than demons desire to oppress us. The good news. Praise God, right? In fact, His desire to protect us is infinitely greater than the devil's desire to oppress us. In fact, the tools he offers us are infinitely more powerful 
than, than the devil's tools, okay? God says he will command his angels concerning us to guard us in all of our ways. And, and when you do a study of like the gibberim, which is the angels of the Old Testament that are designed for fighting, I'm just saying, one angel can put together, put to death 100,000 people, okay? So if one angel will do that, and Jesus said <laughs> to Peter when he's flailing around with the soul, sword, uh, when he was being betrayed by Judas, he goes, I got 12 legions of angels, 144,000 is that, is, I think is 12 legions. And so if one angel can put to death hundreds of thousands, could you imagine 12 legions, okay? So you, the, the, the sheer enormity of power that you and I have present with us, we don't have to worry about these types of things. We don't have to fear the devil, but we do have to be vigilant, okay? Because at the end of the day, demons don't have any power except that which you give them. Okay, lies are really kind of the primary power that they have. Don't get me wrong, demons can actually create physical maladies. In Luke 13, we read about a woman who was bent over for 18 years. It was actually a physical malady caused by Satan, the Bible says, in Luke 13. Or in second, the apostle Paul even said it, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he talks about a, his thorn in his flesh was actually delivered by a messenger of Satan. Okay, so who would oppress him? Now, we don't know what that thorn was, but we know this, the devil can actually oppress us, okay? So hear me, temptations, oppressions, and demonic infestations, though, are not the same as possessions, okay? And again, I don't like the word possession because, you know, they can't possess us except with our authority, which means we technically, you can catch a demon, it is maybe more of a technical way of saying it. You can actually possess a demon in your life, which is not a good thing. And so, uh, really, it, it's people who are demonized, it's, it's people that ceded their authority. Now, why would would anyone ever depend or cede their authority, permit a demon to live in them? Well, why would anyone sin? Think about that, okay? What is sin? Sin always has a function, doesn't it, okay? Unfortunately, it's, a, it's an inferior substitute for something God offers, okay? So uh, before I was a believer, I smoked cigarettes for peace because I didn't have the Holy Spirit who could give me peace. And so I needed this extra thing as an inferior substitute. The only problem is, is unlike the Holy Spirit, it kills me, you know what I'm saying? So there's always a function, but it, it's always an inferior substitute. So if you really, if I could define sin like this, Sin is when we take a legitimate need and meet it with, in an illegitimate way. You have a legitimate need for companionship, now you're trying to meet it in an illegitimate way by dating some non-Christian that doesn't love the Lord, okay? So you're, you're taking a legitimate need, God gave you that need, gave you that desire, but you're meeting it in an illegitimate way. So let's, so let's, let's transfer this into the realm of demonic, okay? Um, Let's say you were mugged, okay, or you were harmed or traumatized by someone. It's natural after having an event like that to have PTSD, right? You have, you have trauma. You're going to experience symptoms of trauma. Maybe you might have extra fear when you leave your house, things like that, okay? Now, some people after a trauma, it's normal to have those feelings, but some people can actually grow dependent upon those trauma feelings. What do I mean, okay? So some people will actually turn to fear, paranoia, and isolation as a protective mechanism, and, and, and they actually become addicted to it to the point where they do not feel safe or healthy until they are wrought with fear, wrought with <laughs> paranoia or isolation. You get the idea. In other words, if I can be paranoid all the time, maybe I can protect myself from ever being in that situation ever again. The only problem is, is fear, paranoia, and isolation all have side effects. Does that make sense? Fear can be an addiction. So the, the, this is really where the devil likes to take us, take opportune times, and he knows that if we are dependent upon sinful emotions in a way that actually leads to dysfunction, we, they basically have free rent. They get to have free load on us, okay? And let, let me give you an example of this, okay? I remember one time I turned on the news and there was this news pundit that was ranting about America. And what was interesting is I happened to really agree with this guy, okay? So I was like, yeah, yeah, okay? So I was watching this. And then immediately the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. Just is clear, just this clear impression, Peter, this guy has a demon of anger, a demon of outrage, and another demon of fear. And he honestly thinks that, that, that anger, outrage, and fear will make this country better somehow. Peter, turn it off or you will catch his spirit. And it was just, it's so in the Bible we call that a discerning of spirits. It's a supernatural impartation of oh, you know what, where this is coming from, okay? 
And what was ironic is I agreed with them, but it was actually the wrong spirit. You see, again, some people honestly think fear, anger, outrage are actually how they improve their lives, right? And over time, they think to themselves, well, I need to continually stoke it up. But heck, I'm just gonna watch the news every single night so that I can keep this thing going, so that I can keep myself vigilant, so I can help the whole world. <laughs> okay, and then, and then we wonder how people get weird. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? In, in other words, it, like, it, so in, in the, think about it, and, and even more than that, then they bring that into church and they're like, I need my pastor to be a political fear monger in order for me to feel safe. This is not a safe church. Because my pastor isn't using his pulpit for anger and for outrage against the same people of outrage that I want to be outraged at. That, I, that This enables me to protect myself. You see, you can kind of see how this actually works, okay? So when you understand the demonic from this vantage point, you can start to see it all over the place, okay? And you see, the, the problem is, is all these things, fear, paranoia, isolation, that, yeah, they might motivate you, and they might be tools of influence, but they're not healthy tools of influence. They actually have side effects. Oh, they actually make enemies. Oh, they actually victimize other people, who then in turn turns into the demonic to victimize other people. You know, pain that is not transformed is transmitted, right? Even fear can be an addiction, okay? So I, I, I just, you see, I, what happens is, and in the King James, there's this expression called a familiar spirit that it refers to people that turn to demons for comfort. And particularly when the King James would use it, it was talking about people that would go to like sorcerers, they wanted to consult mediums and occult stuff like that. But really, it, it, the definition of a familiar spirit is really a person who, they, they turn to demons for comfort. Again, they're not comfortable unless they feel some sort of fear so that they can know that they're safe. And so when you have that spirit, guess what? You also surround yourself with other people that have it which is why even churches can have familiar spirits. And so it begs the question, well then, how do we stay free from all this stuff? I don't think that we need to be afraid of this stuff, but I do think we need to be vigilant. And so let me end with this. Okay, how do we stay free of the demonic? A, it's a healthy fear of the Lord. If the Holy Spirit is highlighting a trigger in you, like, wow, you really overreacted at Thanksgiving dinner, okay? I think it's important to dig that kind of stuff out. Go see a counselor. Go talk to your, your small group. Get, really figure this stuff out. Dig it out. Make sure that you have clarity from the Holy Spirit as to what's going on in your life. Have a healthy fear of the Lord. Don't think it's just normal. You're overreacted, right? The second thing is constantly self-evaluate and confess sin and temptation to your small group. I think all Christians should have a small group. In fact, actually, one of the greatest ways to do demonic deliverance and to get free of demonic deliverance is by living in the light in small groups with other people. So I don't want anybody just to be an attender of a church service here. I want everybody to have someone that they could confess their sin to because ultimately confessing sin is the greatest way to stay free of the demonic, okay? Third thing, constantly forgive others. Forgiveness is one of the very foundations of Christianity. And how do we know if we've forgiven someone? Well, do you rant about people, okay? Rehearsing other people's failures is the chief sign of unforgiveness. You know you've forgiven someone when you no longer feel the need to rehearse their sin. And so if there's someone in your life that you are rehearsing their sins, then, and remember, forgiveness is a process, not a moment. So you, you have to continually forgive. Some people, you're gonna have to forgive them for the next eight months, okay? And by forgiving, you're not letting them off the hook. You're letting them off your hook and putting them on God's hook, okay? So you're not negating justice. You're actually activating justice by letting God take care of it. So forgiving other people, is another thing, and this is one huge cause of the demonic, okay? D, stay filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, what is the Holy Spirit filled with? Joy, right? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. And so in some ways, I, like, you want the Holy Spirit, just become like a child. Sing some of those nursery songs, right? Worship with your little kids. Go back into our kids' ministry and worship. Let me tell you, they're not inhibited. I'm just saying, they'll do snow angels for Jesus on the ground with no snow, okay? So just, you gotta get free like that, and then all of a sudden you'll know the Holy Spirit. And the fifth thing is, just be extra vigilant after traumas and transitions. Remember, Luke, 18, Luke 4, 13, devil left until an opportune time. And so when are opportune times? Well, for non-Christians, it's when they're participating in ongoing sin. Christians theoretically should never have ongoing sin, right? Because they're dealing with their issues, right? So then when do most mature Christians actually get 
uh, afflicted by demons? Well, it's, I would say, during moments of trauma or transition, okay? It's, it's demons that are allowed to enter. Somebody wounded you and you got offended and now you're, you're grinding about it in your head, but you're not forgiving, you're not attending small groups. And so, like over the years, I've heard a lot of people say, I didn't know that Christians could have demons, to which I say, of course they can. Have you ever been in Christian leadership before? <laughs> My goodness, in fact, actually, Jesus taught we should only be casting demons out of Christians, Matthew 12, 43. And why? Jesus said, if you cast a demon out of a non-Christian, you're actually gonna make them worse because if they have not swept the house clean, Matthew 12, 45, the demon's gonna come back with 12 more and they're gonna be 10 times worse. Really, it's, it's only committed Christians that you should even be doing deliverances with because if you don't actually figure out how it got in there in the first place and do what you gotta do in order to change those habits in order to prevent that, then, then literally it makes people worse. And I, I can promise you the more influence and blessing you have, the more demons are gonna target you. Because, you know, I mean, I think about the reason why Carolyn and I are always talking about our emotions, our triggers, and doing internal work. We have counselors, we've, we've got pastors, we've got accountability groups, we have people we confess our sin to, we've got friends who, why? Like, and I'll, what do I talk about with them? Why do I wanna isolate? Why do I love zebra cakes, you know what I'm saying? Why do I wanna punch people while eating zebra cakes? I have to get it all out, you guys. There's a lot of stuff in here that I gotta deal with, right? So I need people I can be comfortable talking about it with who aren't gonna judge me but will definitely help me, right? Who will accept me as I am but will love me too much to leave me the same. And here's the truth. Sometimes our problems have nothing to do with the demonics, okay? Sometimes the problem is just zebra cakes. It's not a demon of zebra cakes, right? But what, what about the devil's food cake? You know, I don't know, okay, we can talk about that. But, but let, me, let me just, let me end with this, okay? Demons will always go after your identity. I remember hearing last year uh, an interesting story about um, a, a pastor who in 1977, he was actually a college kid in Baton Rouge, and uh, he fell in with the wrong crowd. He got caught up in some really bad stuff. He eventually got into this nasty fight, this bar fight that resulted in a murder charge, okay? Next thing you know, he's in jail facing serious prison time, right? And of course, like a lot of people in that situation, he hit rock bottom and he prayed the classic prayer, God, if you get me out of this, I promise you. You know, like I think a lot of us have prayed that prayer at some point in our lives, right? And so he was like, God, just help me get out of this. I promise you I'll devote my life to you. And sure enough, you know, God moved a mountain. He ended up, his sentence got commuted. He made good on his promise, went into full-time ministry. Uh, and, and then a few years later, he was on a mission field in India and so now here he is in Bihar, India. The same man is ministering to a group of people when all of a sudden a demonized man started just shrieking and shouting at him when he came up. And of course it was like, it was kind of similar to how the demon worked with the Apostle Paul in Acts 16. The girl just started shrieking and declaring things about him. And so he casted the demon out of her. And so the same thing with this guy. He, he came up to the man and he, he, he shouted at the demon like, I, you know, I cast you out in the name of Jesus. And the demon said, no, I won't go because I know who you are. And of course, he was like, well, who am I? And he goes, well, you have a spirit of murder and you tried to murder someone in 1977 and just started declaring all these details in English, by the way, out of a guy in India who didn't know English. And of course, you know, uh, like, he was like, wow, I'm on the other side of the world, and yet my past is still chasing me down, and this devil is still trying to remind me of my past. And of course, you know, that just, because he's a, he was a firm believer at this point, it just fired him up even more, and he finally just said to the, this demon, he's like, well, that's who I was, but you know what, I died, I was buried through baptism, Romans 6, 4, and I'm crucified with Christ, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, Galatians 2, 20, and in the name of Jesus Christ, you are gonna come out of this man. And he just cast this out, boom, it was done. And here's the truth, okay? He knew God's word, and he lived in constant fellowship with people who could identify when his thinking is flawed, and so he knew, I don't have a spirit of murder anymore, okay? I wouldn't be here if I did, right? And, and, and I'll tell you what, sometimes we can't even see what's operating in our lives, which is why it is so critical. We have a group of, of people that really, really know us and are doing life with us. And I, I tell this to pastors everywhere. If you don't have regular confession of sin, you're not qualified to be a shepherd. 
You have to have a small group. You have to have a pastor. I, many of you guys know, like in 2020, is just one last story. In 2020, I, I got a major neck injury. And uh, right around Easter time, you guys remember because I had to have a giant neck brace on. And of course, you know, that neck brace, it's like a giant dork flag. You can't, you, can, you know, like everybody has to ask you about it. You know what I'm saying? It's not like you can hide it. You know what I'm saying? You can put like a handkerchief on it and, and, and you know, back, thank God for masks in those days, right? I could just like put it over my, anyway. But I, I just, I, uh, I, I had this, this thing and then everybody would ask me about it. But the, what was so, what a lot of people didn't know was the surgery, because of my, uh, my uh, medical conditions, the surgery they wanted to do, they literally wanted to pull my neck open, pull my vocal cords aside, and then fuse my neck. And for, for people with my condition, there is a 25% chance of death um, with rheumatoid arthritis, and then there is a significant chance that I will lose the ability to talk, and then a very significant chance that I will lose the ability to swallow. And the doctor didn't even want to let me out for one day. And he even told me, listen, you will paralyze yourself if you leave this hospital. And I told him, I am going to get prayer and good advice, and I'm going to leave this hospital. And I know that's not necessarily always smart, but <laughs> I did it. And, uh, and I got, th thankfully, I got, I got a second opinion. Another doctor said, well, if you are very, very careful and you live in this neck brace, never get out of it for the next three months. I'll take a look at you in three months and we'll see if we can avoid the surgery. And of course, you guys all prayed like crazy for me. And, and uh, you know, praise God, I was healed at the end. I mean, literally my, my, literally the ligaments on my neck were reattached, which doesn't happen uh, naturally, okay? So um, it was a medical miracle, but I, I still have to admit though, so I saw a doctor after that and he said, well, you still have congenital stenosis and you will lose all feeling in your hands because remember I had lost all feeling in my arms. And uh, he said, you will, this will be a lifelong issue. You're gonna lose control of your body with time. And uh, you know how a doctor can say those words and it just kind of resonates. I just, you know, that fear overtook me. And in the coming months, that fear turned into something even weirder. I, I don't know how to even describe it, but I had this like constant internal dialogue. Peter, you're not even gonna be around in about six months. And I don't know how to describe it, but I fought it every single day. It was almost like suicidal ideation, but I'm not, it's not suicide, it's just death. You will die soon. You will not see your kids grow up. You will not see your kids get married. You will not. And uh, substance, you better have a transition plan today because you, I mean, like all these things. I, I, I almost became obsessed with it. And it got to the point where when anybody would ask me, what are you dreaming about? I was like, I'm not dreaming about anything. I can't, I'm gonna be dead. You know, like I didn't say that out loud, but I was thinking it. Cause in my mind, I just kept thinking about the doctor and I kept thinking about all these things. And, and I didn't even realize what it actually was until all of a sudden, one day, I, you know, in prayer, I was like, God, why is it impossible for me to get vision for substance right now? Why can I not think about next year to save my life? And, and it was like clear, once again, a discerning of spirit, just this impression, Peter, you have a spirit of death that is wanting to get into you and it is afflicting you. And if you don't rebuke it, it is going to get into you. And, I, and so what did I do? Well, I immediately called up my pastors. I told them what I sensed and I needed them to pray for me and rebuke it off of me. And I also called up my parents who are also my pastors, right? I, thankfully, my parents are believers. And in my, so I, like we happened to be going on a little camping trip um, before my daughter went off to college and I just told, I, I confessed it. I'm like, you guys, I feel like I'm gonna be dead next year. And I know that's a weird idea, you know, cause I'm talking to my dad who's, you know, in his eighties and he's doing great, right? So I kept thinking, I, you know, I, I kept thinking, why am I thinking this way? And so my parents just laid hands on me. They just rebuked death off me. And I'm telling you, it was like, I didn't struggle with it anymore. It was literally gone. It was like, it was totally gone and I was thinking clear. And then the next thing I knew, it was like downloading spiritual email about substance. It was like, ding, ding, ding. Like, do this, do this, do this. Hire this person, do this at your church. It was like vision just flooded into me. And I was like, what the heck? It was like this clogged pipe. And I say this because some of you, you do have demonic oppression 
and it's afflicting you in a physical way. And others of you, it's afflicting you in an emotional way. It's a psychological, even a subconscious way. And God wants you to be free from these things. And the solution is not necessarily to find the most mature man of God or woman of God who can cast something out of you. It's really, you just get a lifestyle of worship, small groups, being filled with the Holy Spirit, the basics. Now, hey, listen, if you do all these things and you realize, oh, I think something's really bad in me, okay, I need help, Pastor Peter, and uh, I need to get this out of me. Okay, if that's you, uh, then we'll talk to you after the service. But I, I'm just saying, like, uh, but, but it, it, we'll, we'll talk about this even coming up this next month. Come on, it's perfect. We have Halloween and then next first Wednesday. Bam! Um, I love it, but uh, I, I've led more people to Christ on Halloween than any other day, and I love it! Um, sorry, I digress. <laughs> um, for real, I have. I've literally led thousands of people to Christ on Halloween. I love it. Um, so, uh, I'm not gonna glorify the devil by avoiding a, I mean, anyway, so I like candy too, but I, I just, I like zebra cakes too. Ah, zebra cakes, okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry, my ADHD is now happening. Okay, let me just pray for you guys. Let me just pray for you guys. Um, Father, it was for freedom you set us free. And every single person here has a calling on their lives that is a joy-filled calling, and we don't know how long we have on earth. But we wanna glorify you with joy every single day of our lives. Lord, I don't always understand a lot of things, but man, we're gonna understand a whole lot when we reach eternity and you give us our resurrection bodies. But, but on this side, Lord, I know that you have more than enough to help us live the lives that you've called us to live. And I just proclaim freedom and joy over everyone. Just, just lift up your hands and receive it. Freedom and joy, freedom and joy. Lord, you see this auditorium, the huge callings on these people. Lord, there are people in this auditorium that have giant callings that will shift the earth. And I, I'm humbled that you would even allow me to be one of their pastors. And, and yet, Lord, as their pastor, I just pray freedom and joy in Jesus' name. Lord, that they would receive it, that it would just soak into that dry area where the devil's been lying to them. And I just say to you right now, yes, you will be married. Stop saying you'll never be married. Yes, you will be healed. Don't, don't, even just, don't even worry about it right now, okay? Just trust the Lord. He's gonna heal you in one way or another, okay? Give him creative license. Yes, God has a great job for you. He has a raise for you. Stop it. Stop worrying about it. He's got you. Yes, God says to you, I've got you more than enough more than enough. And even if the circumstances don't work out the way you want, the Lord says, I have joy for you in every little step of it. Every step of it, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter until the full light of day. I speak joy over you. I speak freedom over you. In the holy name of Jesus, right now, just receive it in Jesus' name.